Thank you, Mark. Hi. Uh, did anybody come to my talk yesterday? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, thank you so much for um, coming the second time. And um, uh, for those of you who missed it yesterday, we did successfully manage to build a debugger. So uh, hopefully, we'll do the same thing again. Um, why am I even talking about debuggers? I uh, work for a company called Aqua Security, and we do security for enterprises who are deploying containers. So uh, what on earth has this got to do with what I do for my job? And uh, the story is that um, I did a talk once about what a container is. And a container is made up of system calls. And then I thought, well, I should really kind of understand and then did a talk about what system calls are. And as part of that talk, I came across Ptrace. So Ptrace is a system call, and it allows one process to observe and control another process. And it's mostly used for two things. One of them is system call tracing. And uh, if you were at GopherCon last year, I did a talk where I showed how you could use ptrace for system call tracing. And it's also used for this other thing, breakpoint debugging. So I thought, ah, I should, I should play with that sometime. That will be good. Uh, so that's kind of how I got to the point of looking at how a debugger works. Uh, there will be a point later on where I do slightly mention security, but primarily, this is going to be about debuggers. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, so the Go uh, system call package gives us a whole bunch of functions related to Ptrace. Ptrace is one system call, but it's actually got, well, this many at least, kind of sub-functions. Um, doing various different things. And you can get some clues from the names, like um, getting registers. We can get information about the registers associated with a particular process. All these calls call, uh, well, they take a, a process ID as a parameter. We can see things like peaking and poking data. I'm old enough to have had a Commodore 64, so I know what peaking and poking is. This is to do with reading and writing to memory. So this sounds pretty interesting and powerful. We also have a couple more calls we're going to use here. There's uh, ptrace cont, cont for continue, so we can allow uh, the process we're looking at to continue. And there's one down here called single step, where we can say, rather than just continuing, just do one step. One step of what? So we're going to talk about uh, how a debugger works. We kind of need to know a little bit about how the machine is executing the code that we've written. We write source code, human-readable code, and the compiler translates that into machine code, which is, well, just about legible, but really not. You know, we, we all prefer the kind of Go stuff on the left-hand side, right? Every line we write gets translated into one or more lines of machine code. And then when the computer is running your code, there's a register called the program counter that keeps track of which instruction we're currently executing. So all this machine code is sitting in memory, sort of sequentially. And as we execute the code, that program counter increments instruction by instruction. So each of these is a single step. If we want to set a breakpoint, we write a particular code, happens to be hex cc, and we write that in at the location where we want the execution to stop. And the process is going to be stepping through the code, instruction by instruction, then it finds this cc byte, and it goes, right, OK, a breakpoint is here. The person debugging this program wants to see what's going on. And it issues a, a trap and basically says, go ahead and, uh, and do some debugging. So to write a debugger, I'm going to have to figure out where to put that hex CC byte and write that into the right place in memory. 
So um, the next sort of step we need to figure out is how do we work out where in memory that instruction is? Where do we want to put the breakpoint? Because as a human, I, I know where I want it to be in terms of source code, right? I, you know, I don't really read the machine code. So I want to be able to map between a line in a file in my source code and some address in memory where the corresponding instruction is in machine code. And there is uh, some code to help us do that. Now, uh, there's uh, this package debug go sim that's going to give us some access to uh, symbol table mapping. Uh, you're going to have to forgive my um, global variables here. This is not a, a kind of best practice write and go sort of a talk. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to be getting some symbols that tell us how to map between machine code instructions and um, the source code. I've actually got a uh, a program, I've called it hello. We'll, we'll look at it in a bit more detail, but it's very simple little executable. Is this bright enough? Can you see? Can you all see this OK? Yeah, there's not. If there's somebody behind me who could turn the lights down a little bit, that would be awesome. I <laughs> don't know if we have a way of doing that. Um, unfortunately, the lighting is not in my control, but I'm sure we can fix that. Great. Um, so this is going to be the target program that we're going to uh, debug, essentially. And if I, uh, there's a thing called read elf, which lets us look at that. Um, if I could spell it right, that would be better. There we go. So lots of complicated information about this executable file. We can see that it is an executable file. And down here, we've got a couple of uh, words, names of sections of information called go sim tab and go program counter line tab. Um, this, this is what we're going to, this is going to give us this mapping that we want. And I wrote some code earlier that it's not very exciting. The, the things I just wanted to point out is we're getting this section for the program counter to line table and another one for symbol table. And we build it into a symbol table, sim table. So I am going to use that. My target file is called hello in the hello directory. And I am going to use my little uh, routine to get the symbol table for that target. Okay, having got that symbol table, I can do some interesting things like looking up a function. I'm pretty confident that there's going to be a main function in a main package, and that's going to give me back some structure that describes that function. And I can print out some information about that. So we'll say it's this function, whatever, and it starts at a particular address. So we get function name and function entry as a starting address. Uh, yeah, let's, let's build that and run it. So oops. So function main starts at some hex address. Hex address isn't terribly useful to me. Uh, I can look it up. I can go symbol table. Uh, go from a program counter address to a line in a file. So if I take that entry and I get back a file, a line, and I think it was a function, if I remember rightly. Let's check. Yeah. Uh, so we'll print out some information about that. So we'll say function whatever is at line. Oops, line. Some number in some file name. So function name, line, file. Oops. Hit save. Build and run it again. 
So that main function is at line 5 in my hello.go file. We can check that. Line 5 is where main is declared, so that's promising. What if I want to go in the other direction and I want to find out, say, for example, what's at line 25? Uh, so if I say line 25, and I can get uh, go from program, sorry, line to program counter. Uh, that's going to take uh, the file name and the line number, and we're going to get back uh, an address and a function and an error that I'm going to ignore because this is not production quality code. And we can print out that information. So that tells me that at line 25, I'm going to be in a function called F3. And we can check that that's true. There I am at line 25. That is in the middle of function F3. My main calls F1, calls F2, calls F3. OK. So we can do this kind of correspondence between an address in machine code and the human readable source code that that corresponds to. Now let's actually run that executable. So I can do that with uh, the exec package. Uh, I'm going to run my target. I need to wire up std in, std out, and std so we can see what's going on. Oops, keep typing that on. Std in. This is where I use multiple cursors, which is so cool. And do it again. There. Okay. And then I can start. So that sets up a, a structure that describes what it is that I want to execute. And then start uh, forks and execs of, of, well, of clones, rather, a function, uh, uh, clones a process to run that executable. And then I can wait for it to finish. This might return an error. So uh, for once, I'm actually going to print out what that is, if there is one. Uh, so wait might return something interesting. And I'm going to just print out something to say that the debugger has finished when, when we're about to complete. So this should run my target executable. It's not going to do anything with it, but it will run it. I'm just going to comment out some of these printfs to make things clearer. Right. So when I run that, my hello executable returned, printed out some stuff. Doesn't really matter what it's printing out. And then the debugger completed. OK. I'm going to add a new line in, because that will really annoy me if I don't. And now I'm going to use ptrace so I can attach my debugger to that program as it's executing. And I do that by setting a system proc attribute here, syscall, sysproc attribute. And I say ptrace. I would like that, please. I would like that on for this executable. So let's see the difference if we uh, run with ptrace enabled. And we see that wait actually returned with this stop signal. We hit the breakpoint trap. So as soon as we've said, I want ptrace on on this executable, as soon as I start it, it immediately gives me this trap back. And then uh, the debugger says it's finished. And then we got the output from the executable. It's just worth showing exactly what's going on there by sleeping here briefly. We'll sleep for um, three seconds, let's say. So we'll build that and run it. So that breakpoint happened immediately. We waited for three seconds. Then the debugger finishes, and then the executable finishes. What's happening is 
uh, the, the debugger is, well, it's not really doing anything, it's just sleeping for three seconds, it exits, and then there's nothing kind of holding that breakpoint on the, on the target executable. So the target is sort of released and allowed to continue. So that's why they happen in that order. Right. So I, my debugger is able to start my target process. Now I want to stop execution, actually set a breakpoint somewhere interesting. And I can do that by using ptrace, uh, and I'm going to poke some data. Let me just check that I'm doing this right. Yes. Right. I'm going to need a process ID, which I'll get in a second. Um, the address, so let's say that I want to stop at line 25. Let's just bring this down here. So I've got a program counter. I actually need to cast it, which tells me where it is, what the address is that I want to insert my breakpoints. And I need to write that hex value CC into that location. And then I need to tell the target executable that it can carry on. And I need to wait for something interesting to happen with that target. So, right. Uh, I need to get that process ID, which is conveniently here. OK. There we go. And uh, if I, well, let's just make sure that that compiles and runs. So we should have a breakpoint at this point. Yeah. OK, build it and run it. OK, so it, it's told us it hit a breakpoint. Let's find out where that breakpoint actually was by examining the state of the CPU's registers at that point. So I can use ptrace get the registers for that process ID, and I'm going to read them into a registers structure, and oops, then let's print some information about that. In fact, let's copy, because uh, I've done this before, let's copy this. And uh, we, oh, I need to convert the um, address into the, I need to go from program counter to a line number. So we should have registers. Now, another word for, or another phrase for program counter is instruction pointer. They can be used kind of interchangeably. So the register that tells me where the program counter is, is called the IP register, our IP. Uh, so that should tell us where we've actually stopped. Let's find out. OK, so it told us we hit the breakpoint, and we stopped in the F3 function at line 25, which is exactly what we asked it to do. OK, um, suppose I want to make this a bit more interactive. Rather than hard coding the line I want to stop at, I um, already wrote a little function to let me input the line number I want to stop at. And I could put this into a for loop. Put all of this in here. OK. So now maybe I say I want to stop at line 25. That's in F3. Maybe I can carry on to line 26. That's still in F3. Maybe I can return back to line 9. That's actually back in the main function again. So I can you know, work through my program. I'm not seeing anything terribly interesting, but I can stop at various points in the program. Now, you might be thinking at this point, but wait a minute, you are just stamping all over your program with hex CC all over the place. Perhaps it would be a good idea to keep a record of what was there before and 
put that back again, otherwise we're going to be left with nothing but hex CC. So let's read out, before we overwrite that value, let's read it out. Uh, we will just need one byte of um, space to put that in. So we have a one byte slice. And then once we've hit that breakpoint, we can write back into that value again. So uh, we could go there, I think. We'll write the original value back in again. Read it, write it, yes. This won't really make any difference, but at least it works. OK. Now, I can see where I've stopped. I can see what file location I'm at, but I'm not really seeing anything very interesting about the state of the program at this point. Maybe a nice thing to see would be a stack trace. So let's uh, just talk for a minute about what a stack trace is and how we might retrieve one. We need to talk a little bit about a couple more registers in the CPU. So we've got the program counter that's pointing to the current instruction that we're going to execute. And we've got two other registers I'm interested in, the stack pointer and the base pointer. And they point to some different locations in memory, and the range between them is what's called the current stack frame. And this is a space in memory that the current function, whatever the current f currently executing function is, it can use this stack frame, this bit of memory, to, as a kind of scratch pad, if you like. So it's a space for local variables, uh, the parameters that the function got called with get stored there, return values get stored there. Then if we call from one function to another function, interesting things happen with these pointers and in the call stack. So the first thing that happens is the current value of the program counter gets written into the top of the stack. And this tells us when we return from the function we're about to call, this is where we need to go back to. This is the next instruction we're going to uh, execute. Then we store the current base pointer value. And the base pointer is, at the moment, pointing to the, previous, the top of the previous stack frame. We move the base pointer to point to that value again. And there's some amount of stack is going to be allocated for the new function. So the stack pointer points to the top of it. The base pointer points to well, the address of the previous stack frame which is what it was pointing to before we called the new function. Every time we call a function, we get this new stack frame allocated. They build up on top of each other. And if you t take the base pointer, it takes you to the previous stack frame, which points to the previous stack frame, which points to the previous stack frame, and so on. So to look at what the call stack is, we can chain through, starting from the base pointer, and at the top of each stack, we've got the program counter. And we can use that PC to line function to say where that, you know, what the source code relating to that address actually is. It's a little bit too much code for me to write in the course of a talk, so I slightly cheat with this bit. Here is uh, some code that does this outputting of a stack. Um, there's also a little bit of code here to cope with the fact that those stack pointers, I kind of showed them the stack pointer and the base pointer updating magically at once, but th there are machine code instructions that do that. And while they're updating, the frame size can look really weird. But normally, the frame size is the space between the base pointer and the stack pointer. Uh, down here, I, well, I read the data for the next uh, stack frame. At the top of it, the first um, eight bytes is the address of the next function. There's PC to line telling us what source code that corresponds to, which we'll print out. And then I'm also just going to print out the hex values of a few more things on the stack. 
So I can call that here, output stack. And that takes the symbol table, the process ID, and the current instruction pointer, the current stack pointer, and the current base pointer. So if I stop at line 25, it tells us you stopped in F3. And we can see some stuff pulled from the stack. It was called by function F2. Here's some information about that stack frame, or some contents on that stack frame, which was called by F1, which was called by main function. And I could, uh, if I go to line 26, which is still in F3, um, we still see the same sort of F3, F2, F1. If I go back to line um, 9, I think will work. Yeah, we're in main.main .main again, so we've returned out of all those functions. Another thing I would like to do is show how that stack kind of changes as we single step through the machine code. And uh, there was a ptrace function we can use to do that, which is ptrace single step. So what I'm going to say is, if I don't enter a line number, let's just do a single step. So we will switch on whatever the line number is. And uh, that function returns minus 1 if I, if I don't put a number in. So if that happens, I'm going to do the ptrace single step. On, oh. There we go, process ID. Where are these funny braces coming from? I uh, think that's all I need, yeah. And if I do put in a number, we will do this stuff where we convert it to a particular line number. OK. And. I'm also going to have a case for if I put in the number 0, in which case I want to uh, let the target pro This is just going to let us exit. We'll let the target process continue until it's finished. And we will break out of this loop. I need to put a label in. OK. So what have I forgotten? Oh, I know what I've forgotten. If we do the single step, we also need to wait for uh, a signal to say that that sig single step has actually happened. OK. So we will print out the stack either way. I'm just going to get rid of that because it might mess up the formatting. OK. Let's give that a try. Did I save it? Yes. Let's give that a try. OK, so let's go to line 25 again. And we can see the stack as we did before. And I'm going to single step. And it actually went straight to line 26. We can see the stack. And then if I single step a little bit more, we will start to see things changing in that stack. And uh, we'll start, we've returned back to function 2. We can see this hex 777 value kind of bubbling back up. Uh, and eventually we'll get back to the main function. There we go. I'm going to quit out at that point. It's allowed the target process to finish. So we've got a reasonably full function debugger now. We can stop at any line we want. We can single step through. We can see the state of the stack. It's not like we can inspect variables by name or anything, but we can do quite a lot at this point. OK, there's one more thing that I really wanted to do. Ptrace is super powerful. Not only can we examine the memory and the registers, we can change them. So I thought it would be pretty fun to see whether we can overwrite and change what that target process is doing. And if we go back to looking at the, the source code and the machine code, this is actually the machine code for the actual F3 that we're working with here. 
And uh, I set the breakpoint here at line 25. This is line 25. And let's say that I want to change what this return value is. Um, it's, we can see in the, in the assembler here, we've, you know, I don't think we need to be assembler experts to kind of think, OK, this is adding the hex value of 4444, four, four, which is probably relates to what's happening in this return line. And it's storing the result in the AX register. There are lots of different registers. AX is one of them. Uh, I wrote a little utility function to write out the state of a few of the registers. I uh, just need to pass in the registers. OK. So let's go to line 25 again. And we can see that currently, the AX register contains all the threes. And if we single step over a bit, that's all the threes plus all the fours. I've added hex all the fours to hex all the threes. And that's the return value that we are ultimately, it's going to bubble back up through F3, back to F2, back to F1, and get printed out. Because if you recall, when we quit out of here, we print out all the sevens. So what if I want to mess with that value? I can do that with a set registers ptrace subcommand. I only want to do it at a particular point in the program. So I'm going to say, if we happen to be on line 26, and if the registers, well, the, R, the AX register currently contains all the sevens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then I, well, first of all, let's say I'm doing some overwriting. And I'm going to modify that value to, let's make it all the eights. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we trace uh, set registers. That process ID registers. OK. Ooh, something it didn't like. Oh, I know. It needs to be a pointer. OK, so let's do the same thing. Go back to line 25. And I've currently got all the threes. And we'll single step through a bit. And there's my all the sevens. It's a little bit low on the screen. I, don't, I hope you can see it. We've got all the sevens. We've said we did the overwrite. And there are all the eights. So I've managed to write eights into the AX register. And if I let that carry on to completion, this returned all the eights. So my debugger has become a kind of hacking tool where I can modify what the target process is doing. Now, <laughs> I did say I will come back to a small security point. And this is basically my security point. If you are, um, because of this fact, there is almost no reason imaginable why you should ever allow one process to p-trace another process in production. You should not be debugging in production. And any process that can do p-trace, suppose it gets compromised, it can change what's fundamentally going on in your other processes. It can read data out of those processes. This is pretty dangerous stuff. For that reason, how many of you are using containers? Pretty large number of you. If you're using Docker, there is a thing called set comp profile. Uh, and Docker has a default set comp profile that Jess Frizzell wrote a few years ago. Really good, sensible default profile. What setcomp does is limit the set of system calls that a particular process is allowed to call. And the default Docker setcomp profile will disallow ptrace, which is a very sensible thing to do, because there's almost no reason why you should allow anything to use ptrace. Hands up if you are using Kubernetes. 
Okay, you need to pay particular attention because although that is the default in Docker, it is not the default in Kubernetes. You have to explicitly set that set comp profile. Um, and I'll be happy to tell you about how to do that afterwards if you are interested in doing so. Uh, if you would like to see that code in a little bit more detail, it's on my GitHub repo under Debugger from Scratch. Uh, I wanted to shout out for, um, I hope I pronounce his name right, Michal Levitsky. He wrote some blog posts that were really helpful to me when I was first exploring this topic, and also Phil Pearl, who had some stuff about how the stack trace part works, it was really useful. And I'm going to leave you with one last link, a small plug for a free tool that we do at Aqua. Those of you who had your hands up for containers, how many of you are scanning your container images for vulnerabilities? Quite a few of you. Good, good. If you're not already doing it, this is free to use. It will help you um, expose whether any of your images have known vulnerabilities, you know, the kind of heart bleeds and, um, you know, vulnerabilities and dependencies. And if they're, aside from using sensible ptrace defaults, or sensible setcomp defaults, scanning, whether you use our scanner or somebody else's, scanning for vulnerabilities is probably you know, the best way you can avoid everyday common or garden attacks. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I don't know if we have time, if anybody has any questions. Or <laughs> There's a question, OK. Oh, OK. Can we, can we do that? Can we do that? We got time? Yeah. No. Cheers. Thank you. Mark's our runner. Oh, awesome. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm getting all my steps this week. Who had the question? Raise your hand right here. OK. Hi there. Um, my question was, how, how cross-platform is P-Trace? Oh, <laughs> um, I am not the best person to answer that question. Uh, it definitely exists on, you know, Linux-like platforms. I believe there's an operating system called Windows, and um, <laughs> that's pretty much everything I know about it. So I'm sure there are other people. Anybody know about Windows? <laughs> I'm sure there are other people who can help you. That I'm not the person, unfortunately. Other questions for Liz? No? Awesome. Thank you very Thank much, you very Liz. Much. We appreciate it.